There we go. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. I can hear myself next door, so it's a little weird. Um, and I'm looking for Dr. Pratiba. And oh, there you are. Hi. You can unmute yourself. Nice. Thank you so much. This is um, Dr. Pratiba Shah, who is Doctor of Ayurveda and a Master's in Public Health and many other wonderful things, as well as a teacher directly to me, who I'm very grateful to, and has provided really good care for me as experienced that from my own. And um, Dr. Pratiba, we um, invited you because you have such wisdom coming from uh, a beautiful tradition. And so I wanted to give you space to share with us. Thank you. Thank you. A namaste and greetings to everybody who is uh, attending in person in Maine and everybody else who has joined virtually. Um, it is interesting that I was actually visiting Australia just this past month and I was there for about a month and I got introduced to some of the indigenous um, communities there about them, not directly meeting them, but about how they are recognized in all of the public places, actually. There are three flags always. One is the Australian flag, one is the tribal flag, and I'm forgetting one is, I think, the state flag or something. But the tribes are always being acknowledged, which is such a wonderful thing to see. And I know that there are speakers from Australia here, so... It's interesting. And I apologize that I did plan to be there in person, but uh, because I was a little ill when I landed back, I've decided to take a slow weekend. So I'm joining all of you virtually. Uh, thank you, Josie. And thank you to all of the organizers for putting together this beautiful uh, meeting space uh, to immerse in subjects that are often sidelined and trivialized by uh, what we consider as the Western scientific community in present times. And this is such a wonderful opportunity for like-minded people to come together and to hear each other, learn from one another, and take this philosophy forward that whatever the accumulated wisdom around the globe from so many multiple traditions across the world, there is so much to learn from, there is so much to be enriched from and to get fresh directions in how we should be living our life as individuals and as global citizens. And I will start to share my screen now. Uh, Josie has encouraged me and guided me to be uh, more informal, more conversational. Um, and um, I have tried to put together my presentation, which is less slides but there will be more interaction and conversation. So please feel free to put your thoughts, comments, questions in the chat box. And um, hopefully they will pop up on my screen and I will be able to interact based on them. So let me try and share my screen now. Looks great, thank you. Thank you. So uh, this is my uh, given topic, uh, but we had also discussed about weaving in this room and what does it mean? So I have tried to take care of the learning objectives as well as uh, the given topic. A vast topic, but you know, I'll try and um, bring in as much insight as possible with a lot of humility because uh, this is just a vast ocean where we can just continue to discuss, dive and continue to discover a uh, lot of pearls, a lot of pearls 
to guide our lives. Uh, this is just a small disclaimer that what I'm presenting today are my own uh, thought processes, uh, and they will be excerpts from publications, from articles, but uh, none of this is a medical advice. So I would like to invite you all to join me in enchanting or just listening, whatever makes you comfortable, to this wonderful chant from the Indian subcontinent, from very ancient scriptures, which um, give us a beautiful surrender to powers that are higher than us and help us to develop humility, which comes with this surrender and let go of the ego that is a big part of all the problems that we are in today. As human beings, we have nourished the ego and we have let go of the humility of knowing that we are a very small part of a very big web of life. And it is not us who controls it is the surrender that brings us closer to a divine way of living. So please join me. I'm going to read it and I'm going to also explain the meaning of it. And anybody who knows the chant can join me. Om Asatoma Satgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityurma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 What this chant or mantra means is that, O oh, higher power, however you see this higher power, Whatever brings you comfort, faith, trust, belief, whether it's Jesus or Allah or uh, our Hindu gods or any other divine entity, just pray to that divine entity whenever you get an opportunity. O oh, divine, lead me from the untruth to the truth. Lead me from darkness to light. Lead me from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. So this is part of what we call Shanti mantras or mantras that invoke peace, global peace. So all in all, in this whole mantra, there is a lot of practice of humility. You know, we are not all pervading. There is there is a higher power that is all pervading. And we are just a tiny part of the whole scheme of things. And this is an important practice in today's world, because as I said, a lot of problems are arising from the human ego that we know all and we control all. And we are now beginning to see the consequences of this ego and I'll touch upon that in a little bit. But this is a beautiful prayer to begin um, the session. And then another uh, mantra or verse that is that I find very beautiful and very nourishing, uh, a thought that is very nourishing and very elevating, very purifying, is... The thought that I am Nijaha Paroveti Ganana Laghu Chetasa Udara Charita Nam to Vasudheva Kutumbaka. This is mine, that is his, say the small minded. The wise belief that the entire world is a family. So these are some beautiful thoughts with which I wanted to start the session. And then there is another beautiful poem that I picked up from, um, from uh, an article that I was reading. Uh, 
Let me see if I can get the full screen. We have come, dear relatives, as, as fruits for others' nourishment. So there is so much meaning in these two lines itself. So we have come on this earth as fruits for others' nourishment. It's a beautiful sentiment to hold on to and develop. Because we have not come here for ourselves. We have come here for others. As hummingbirds flutter in joy and bears rest in awe, so we dress with the colors of the rainbow to weave our skin together. Irrespective of the colors of our skins, of our ethnicities, of our religions, we are dressed in the colors of the rainbow which unites us. In community circles, Mother Earth welcomes our songs. Here we gather until we return to her in service. So this paragraph is so profound. It lets us get free of the fear of death because it's saying right here that we are just gathering here for a few moments in, in, in eternal time. And at some point when it is designated, we shall return to her in service. So there is a lot of profound wisdom in this poem. We come to stand by each other, to sing to each other, to let the chanting flow for each other, our kin. It is life holy who sends us. We come to make kin here. So there is the purpose of life. That is it. Basic, simple, and an elevated sentiment. It is not for ourselves. So there is no selfishness here. The, the purpose of life is very clear. Now, I will be sharing with you about a system called Ayurveda. And that is what my training is in. That is what my expertise is in. And Ayurveda is a wisdom uh, tradition that uh, has been founded and developed over centuries in the subcontinent of India. It dates back to almost 5,000 years. So it's a very, very ancient uh, healing science, not medical science, I would say, because healing is much more than medicine. And uh, it is considered to be one of the world's most ancient continuously practiced systems of healing and wellness. So in Ayurveda, one of the synonyms of disease is Dukkha. Dukkha means hurt or sadness. So if we keep even these three mantras or poems or verses that I have shared, that I have selected to share today, it, it helps you not to experience Dukkha or sadness or hurt or trauma. Because the purpose is then clear. We are here in a journey, in a brief snapshot of time. We come here, we surrender to everybody around us. We live for a purpose. And then when it is time, we leave. So it is just a small journey in the vast snapshot of time that we don't know when it started, when it's going to end. It is eternal. So for this brief period of time, it is possible to live in joy and happiness. And it is a matter of practice. It does not come easy because we do get connected. We do get entangled. But, um, sorry. But we have to Remind ourselves, why are we here? And that helps to elevate us from our sorrows, day-to-day -day sorrows. So a little bit about me. I come from India. Um, as you can see on the left-hand side, India is a large country. Uh, I was born in northern India. You can see Delhi with a star. So I was born in the capital of India, uh, a very urban city. And then um, when I was seven years old, we moved to Bangalore, which is 
in the southern part of India. And most of my childhood, my education was in Bangalore. And then I moved to Mumbai, which I have not captured here, which is on the western part of India, the, you know, the left lip-like structure that you see. That is where I did my undergrad. And then again, I moved to the northern part to finish my post-graduation or MD in Ayurveda in the National Institute of Ayurveda in Jaipur. And um, so this whole education was five and a half years of undergrad and three years of MD. And then I appeared on my father's insistence in a All India exam uh, for, um, for a first class gazetted officer position in the government of India. And um, I really sat for the exam on my father's insistence just to satisfy him. But lo and behold, I was I became one of the 12 selected all over India. And I was ranked five. And then when I received a lot of congratulatory notes, I realized probably this is something amazing. And that's what led me to being in the Ministry of Ayush for 13 years. And then I came to um US to follow my husband and family who got a job offer here and I also then got a master's in public health and I have been this is my other home now I practice here I teach and I run two nonprofits uh Ayurveda uh is my passion and it's my purpose uh besides being my profession so that's a little bit background about me. And um, as you can see that on the left-hand side, you can see very urban cities. Uh, however, my roots are uh, in the villages in the sense that both my parents come from very um, traditional ways of living or came from, they are no longer with us, um, very traditional ways of living living in um, harmony with uh, with the nature, with uh, the animals. As you can see, it's very common for cows and cattle and, uh, you know, bird feeding. These are very common traditional practices in, in the rural parts of India. And traditional ways of farming, crop rotation, um, seasonal harvestation, uh, milestone celebrations, for those transitions between crops, between uh, seasons, um, festivities, but also um, starting off different types of foods for those seasons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they really grew up in surrounded by that that kind of traditional wisdom of how to live in harmony with nature, and then. Um, like it was happening all over the world, uh, you know, industrialization was taking place and then for better opportunities and prospects, they moved to the cities and we all know what urbanization has done to this world. So a lot of India is still rural, but unfortunately, those rural areas, which which are the keepers of the wisdom of our land, they are disappearing slowly, tragically. However, with movements like this, with, with meetings like this, there is hope that wisdom will win over ignorance and we will start to embrace um, the wise ways of living, which were more in harmony, in respect of everything around us. And we will go back to a respectful way of living rather than an egoistic way of living. This is a family picture. Um, I'm the youngest, I'm in my father's embrace. Um, we, we are five siblings. Uh, two of my siblings are stars now, along with my parents. So we are three left and we are very close by God's grace. And this is another uh, picture uh, in front of the Taj Mahal, 
if you have heard of Taj Mahal, um, my two older siblings were in hostel. And so it's just the three younger ones here with my parents. So these are just beautiful memories. Um, and now let's do a little bit of dive into my topic for today. So here is a little bit of a very, very brief summary or a synopsis of how we used to live traditionally. So that living was community style with awareness and value building. When I say value building, it was learning about the values, but also building upon them with teachings, with uh, role modeling, with uh, opportunities to practice those values and encouragement and reward when those values were imbibed around the interconnectedness of things. So this is a very key word, the interconnectedness. It's a very simple word uh, at the outset, but if you start to reflect on it, it really includes all of the wisdom that we need to know. All of us are interconnected. Uh, May I request, there's someone's video that continues to move. It's a little distracting. Uh, I don't know who that might be. May I request the video to be off if you're moving, please? Thank you. So if we keep in mind the interconnectedness of things, that we are not alone. We are not alone. We are connected with the spirit of the forest with the spirit of other fellow beings, with the spirit of other living things on this planet, then we will know to care for one another like a family and for the nature and everything around us, whether it's animate or inanimate. And in our Eastern culture, uh, in the traditional practices, there is a there are rituals to honor uh, everything around us. In India, you can find people worshipping mountains, stones, trees, uh, maybe uh, putting garlands around cows. So this is not to be frowned down upon. It actually displays a value set that has been traditionally taught and integrated to respect everything around us, whether it is living or non-living. That is what it displays. So this is nothing to be to ridicule. Uh, actually, I'm a Hindu, so to say. I'm not a religious person. I'm spiritual. But in our Hindu uh, religion, we have like choice of maybe 100 gods. So again, this is not something to make fun of but it's it's the liberty given to everybody that whatever helps you to elevate yourself whatever invokes faith in you to surrender to something higher and therefore develop goodness inside you is okay it is acceptable so we are not talking about a single God. And if you don't worship to this God, then you are going to hell. There is no such philosophy in Hinduism. You can, uh, you can have uh, your own chosen God and your own chosen methods of worship. And it is all accepted. So this is the wisdom in, in the traditions of the land. And not just in India, but... Uh, all across the globe, you can find such traditional wisdom of respecting uh, the, the large web of life that we all are a small part of. And then very importantly, there was also a lot of focus in passing down this traditional and accumulated wisdom from generation to generation. Now, this is a beautiful quote here that I again came across in one of my readings, all things are connected like the blood that unites us. We did not weave the web of life. We are merely a strand in it. Um, sorry. 
whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. So this has been said by Chief Seattle from the Squamish Nation. Now, this is extremely, extremely profound. Again, you know, I mean, you can pick up whatever words, verses, chants, mantras speak to you, but they can become your guiding life mantra. I find this very, very profound. That if you just remind yourself that we are a mere strand in the large web of life and whatever we are doing to the web, we are doing to ourselves. In current times, we have started to live in a way that feels that we are uh, immune to anything that is happening outside. Doesn't matter if it's rain or winter or hailstorm or a hurricane, whatever it is, we will have some kind of protective building or mechanism to save our life and carry on with, the, with our ways of living. But if you think about this philosophy, then whatever unnatural changes are happening outside of our shells should be a matter of concern to us. If the soil is being eroded, it should concern us. If the forests are being deforested, it should concern us. If there are, there are wars that are happening and there are genocides that are happening, it should concern us. Because whatever is happening to the large web is going to come back and affect us as well. This is extremely important to reflect upon and integrate into our life perspective and it will help us to live very differently. Now here are some of the challenges that are part of our current ways of living. As I was mentioning, our ego as a superior species has taken over our common sense. We are now living in the false sense that we control the world. We control every process that is happening in the world. You know, we want to control the economics. We want to control the humanities. We want to control societies. So we live in a sad but deep illusion that we control the planet. We are taught very systematically through our education systems that wealth and ownership are the key to happiness. We live in a culture of instant gratification with no real connections and even less awareness or responsibility toward our planet, our resources, our fellow species, any depth in our living or values in the way we live. Our education system has slowly but surely stopped teaching any moral science, any parts of the moral science that used to be a part of at least when I was growing up. And basic life values in schools and colleges are educational system, uh, systems. We are losing our intelligence, basic intelligence of, again, remembering that we are, a, we are a strand in the big web of life and whatever happens to the web does affect us in long term and as well as short term. But we are happy developing AI, artificial intelligence, not realizing that very soon AI might be controlling us rather than the other way around. So we are losing our basic innate intelligence and wisdom. And it, the irony is we are trying to make a machine smart while losing our smarts. And we are already beginning to see, I don't know how many of you are um, exposed to what is happening, deep fake and all of the altered um, and uh, misinforming videos and uh, messages and social media posts that are beginning to now unleash in our lives uh, and it's going to become only worse from here you will not know whether it's uh, your mom calling or if it's AI calling we've already had some incidents already of cheatings and also 
I just yesterday I was hearing that President Biden's um altered uh, false fake telephone message has landed in New Hampshire in everyone's inbox, uh, giving a very misleading message. And it sounds like President Biden. So welcome to 21st century. And who is unleashing this type of uncontrolled demon? Us. And we are very proud about it. Right? So it's unimaginable what's going to happen in even near future. And we are already beginning to see all of those effects. But the irony is we are, we are celebrating it. We are proud of it. So it's like uh, the, the pinnacle of uh, taking leave of basic common sense and intelligence. Um, so fingers crossed to what's coming up next. And this is exponential. It's not happening on a slow timeline. It's, it's happening very, very rapidly. Most importantly, and again, due to our collective ego, we have chosen to re reject the accumulated wisdom of centuries. And again, this has been systematized in our schools, in our colleges, in our societies. We are constantly being told that whatever we, the practices of the past were meaningless, uh, th those practices are ridiculed. Uh, systems like Ayurveda, which are vast, which are deep, which are profound, which continue to provide uh, robust solutions, even in the 21st century, they are rejected at the outset. They are ridiculed. Uh, they are systematically kept out by people who are minting money out of illness and sicknesses that are self-generated to a large extent. And this has led to a progressive decline of a collective conscience resulting in uncontrolled exploitation of natural resources. It's like, there's no tomorrow. Let's consume everything. You know, it's a culture of greed, consumption, mindless, causing not only environmental degradation, massive loss of biodiversity, human rights violations, climate change, and more, all in the name of progress and development. That is the irony of this whole thing that United States is a developed country. It's a leader of the world, but this leader of the world is spending twice the amount of any other comparable nation's GDP on healthcare with the worst health outcomes. What is the index of development then? So this is ridiculous. You know, I mean, we need to really take charge as individuals, as communities, and change this narrative, change this way of living. The increased discontent and decline of simple life values is a direct result of the destruction and depletion of the web that we are an integral part of. That is the bottom line. This is just a screenshot of so many, so many challenges facing humanity in the 21st century. You can deep dive deep into any one of them you know deforestation water crisis food waste diseases genetic engineering the list goes on i mean i've just uh taken a screenshot just to bring a little bit of focus on what are the different areas of challenges which if not if we do not change our ways of living we are headed for sure disaster and i try not to think about it because thinking about it does nothing. We need to take action. Now, how do we define wisdom? For all its many classical definitions, wisdom is usually regarded as the ability to know the right thing to do in difficult circumstances, which we are in right now, and to be able to identify what matters most among myriad choices. That is something different from head knowledge. So we are not talking about IQ. We're not talking about IQ here at all. We are talking about so many other cues, EQs and other things. McLaughlin and McMahon see wisdom as an embodied disposition or act resulting from deep contemplation that leads to self-transcendence, tranquility and elevated insight. Each word is a pearl. So how do we elevate by deep contemplation? So in Ayurveda, again, uh, we have this notion of the universe is within us and outside us. So outside us, of course, we know, but it is, it is also 
as vast and as deep within us. So we don't have to take a, 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 a rocket or something to travel the universe. We can just deep dive inside. And that is called reflection and contemplation. And when we start to do that, we will develop the proper insight that is needed, an elevated insight, where we are not micro-focusing, but we are able to see the big picture. It is the apex of intellectual and moral judgment. Each word is precious here. Experienced within the orchestration of emotions, desires, and life experience. We are not going to get disconnected and go in a vacuum and then experience that. No, while we are living in all of this, we have to develop that. A calling to higher self and a more noble way of existing in the world. Very short, but very, very profound. And dictionary.com defines wisdom as the ability or result of an ability to think and act utilizing knowledge. Knowledge and wisdom are two different things. Uh, wisdom is the act of utilizing knowledge, experience, understanding, common sense, and insight. Each word is again important. Accumulated knowledge, erudition, or enlightenment. Now, let us now segue into what I represent as um, the, the stream of tradition and wisdom that I am uh, going to share today, what I am trained in. So there are four bodies of knowledge or uh, wisdom that are um, um, particular to the Indian subcontinent. And in the order of chronology, these are Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, and uh, Atharva Veda. So Veda means knowledge. So these are streams of knowledge that were passed on from generation to generation through the oral tradition for many, many, many centuries until the medium of writing was discovered or invented. And then the documentation has started and we have these bodies of knowledge. And Ayurveda, what I represent and I'm trained in is considered to be a sub stream of knowledge or wisdom of the last Veda, which is the Atharva Veda, this last one. So Ayurveda is a complex Sanskrit word. Now Sanskrit is one of the most ancient languages of the world, like Latin. Ayurveda is a complex Sanskrit word made up of two individual Sanskrit words, Ayu and Veda. So Veda means knowledge, as I said, or uh, information or wisdom accumulation. And Ayu means life. So basically Ayurveda is the, um, what I like to call in simple language, it's the user manual of life. Okay. You want to live life. You want to live life properly. You pick up the user manual. You understand who am I? What is the universe? What is our connection? And what am I made up of? How am I unique? How can I live in respect of this uniqueness? And what are my best ways of living? Uh, seasonal eating, uh, daily self-care, um, uh, care in different phases of our lives. Uh, so really deep understanding, all the information is there in this user manual. So it's a beautiful way of understanding this vast wisdom around life. And here is a beautiful definition of health as stated in Ayurveda, samadosha samagnishcha samadhatu malakriya prasanna atma indriya manaha swasthe tibidhiyate. So the beauty of this is that this definition of health is not restricted to the harmony or equilibrium in our bodily parts, in our physical components, in our physiological components. What Ayurveda is saying is that is not enough to designate you as healthy. What is equally important is prasanna atma indriya mana. Prasanna means joyful. A joyful state of your mind, soul, spirit, emotions. Then you are healthy. So this is again a pearl of wisdom that I wanted to share with you. That in this tradition that I am a part of, that I am representing, Health is not just your BMI being ideal. 
your lipid panel being ideal or your HbA1c being within the normal range, you are much more than that. Western science tends to be reductionist. And unless you are fitting in that box or checking off that box, uh, anything out of that check box is not even heard, is not even acknowledged. But as an individual, you know what you're experiencing. So always trust yourself and know that there is much more to you than your physical and physiological body. And this is the most profound principle in Ayurveda that the entire universe is made from unique combinations of five primordial elements or what we call pancha, five, mahabhutas, um, primordial elements. That would be the most uh, close transliteration that I can share. And these five maha, pancha mahabhutas are ether or space, air, fire, water, earth. And these come together in different proportions, combinations to create the universe, including us. And that provides the common denominator, the interconnectedness that we were talking about in the early slide. This is the common thread through all of us. And which is why anything that happens to the pancha mahabhutas of anything outside of us is going to impact us because we are also composed of the same pancha mahabhutas. We come from these elements and we go back to these five elements. That is the beauty of life. Um, now, very quickly, I know I'm coming to the end of the presentation and I want to leave at least five, seven minutes for questions. Uh, five wise pearls for global wholeness. Again, this is, this is just like some... Um, you know, uh, summary points cannot cover everything. Embrace the wisdom tradition that speaks to you, whatever that might be, you know, from your own family lineage or something else that you have come across that you have resonated with. Understand and incorporate the teachings of the people who have been living in synchronicity with the earth and taking care of her for generations. Develop a deep awareness around the interconnectedness of everything in the web of animate and inanimate that make up our universe. And let this awareness always guide our actions. This is important. We don't just get up and do things oh, today. This is my mood and, you know, this is what I feel like to me. Um, and that is sometimes also fine, you know, to indulge in ourselves. But ultimately, the larger guidelines should be to be aware of this interconnectedness and let that guide our actions and choices as individuals and as societies. Find a spiritual connection with the earth. Remember that we are all spirits, just like the forest, the water, and the land. Protect all parts of the web and protect the protectors. Very important. Let go of ego. And this is an everyday practice because by default, we will tend to fall back into our ego self. But let go of ego every day and practice it diligently. Inculcate humility. This is again a matter of practice around the fact that we are but a tiny part of something much bigger than ourselves. This is a reminder, 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 because we tend to forget. We tend to micro-focus on our world. And that becomes, you know, then that disconnects us from the large web. So this is all a matter of practice and an Iroquois proverb, Iroquois is again an ancient tradition. Our greatest strength is our gentleness. It is through our gentleness and we have to invoke that every day. We all have that gentleness. We all have that softness. It is through our gentleness that we access this unity and connectivity. It is through our gentleness that we find compassion and empathy. For those around us, as well as for the planet, it is only a false narcissistic strength that separates us and makes us more or less important, more or less important than someone else. That is also not good. This is also not good. So let's try and lean towards equilibrium and harmony as a practice. Sorry. Five wise pearls for self-wholeness. Remember, 
whole health comprises of not just physical health, but also our mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Always prioritize self-care. An empty jug cannot serve anyone or anything. <coughs> Sorry, give me one second. <coughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> Always prioritize self-care and should take into consideration all parts of our being, not just physical health, not just going to the gym, but also nurturing our emotional being, our spiritual being. <clears throat> that is very important. A lot of time, disease processes originate in our emotional well-being. And this is what I have always shared with my students who have I had the honor of sharing some teachings um, that go beyond the physical being. Strive to, strive to live a purpose-filled and service-oriented life because that is very fulfilling. And that nourishes your spiritual and uh, emotional well-being. Incorporate good values and models in your life as per the teachings and guidelines found in all wisdom traditions around the world. Practice keeping desires and expectations at a minimum as these are the root causes of grief. This is very important. <clears throat> and I wanted to share this that I always, you know, I've been saying for many years now. If we can re redefine success as health and happiness rather than money and material, our pursuits and choices in life might completely change. So you can think about it a little bit. These are just some pictures to show um, what Ayurvedic practice involves, herbs, spices, plants, um, body works, um, as you can see here. Uh, so with that, I want to leave some time for uh, discussion. Questions? I'm going to unmute myself, Dr. Pratiba, for a moment because um, thank you so much. It's so profound and so beautiful and so respectful and so embodied. And um, I was thinking about this term called uteria that means um, a positive feeling one has when you realize that you're connected to all of nature, which is what I feel, what I, you know, I feel like we all know this, um, but then as a physician, I think we forget. So the simplicity of remembering that we are the air, we have the fire, we, you know, we are embodied water, we are embodied space and earth. Uh, th these are the, these beautiful elements and that you know, I think we feel so disconnected often and sad because we don't feel connected, but you just look to the sky, you know. Um, and 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 so this is what I was leading to is the the morning practice of honoring your senses. I wonder if you might speak to that. I think it's really a beautiful practice. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for. Uh, wording this so beautifully um, and uh, just to um, add to what you were saying just reflecting on depth and space depth and space so if you put your feet on the ground and know the depth of you know what goes underneath your feet and looking at the sky uh, <clears throat> can be very healing but um, to the point you said about honoring our senses and nourishing them and getting an opportunity to touch them uh, is, is a beautiful part of self-care, uh, which in Ayurveda we prioritize, we highlight, we focus on that. 
and it is called Abhyanga. Anga means body parts. Abhi means to touch. So if we are able to find time and space to touch ourselves, because there are so many components to this. First of all, our hands have so many healing energy centers. So when we use our hands on anything, even on others, that is the principle of Reiki and pranic healing. <clears throat> These have so many healing centers, the hands, both our palms. And if we are able to direct it to ourselves, if you remember, I had really put self-care on top of the list. And I had uh, suggested that this is something we all need to uh, prioritize. Self-love, self-care. Because if you don't have oxygen, you cannot give oxygen to others. You should, you should first take care of yourself. Then there's nothing selfish about it. First of all, let's let go of that notion that, you know, if I'm spending time on myself, I'm being selfish. No. If you are healthy and in harmony and in peace, you are going to emanate that and you're going to be able to be give much more than if you are not healthy and not grounded, not at peace. So first thing in the morning, <clears throat> in addition to doing some warm water, some you know belly breathing or some sort of meditation, but once you're up and moving, if you can find even five minutes to touch at least your sensory organs, uh, and um, if you can touch your whole skin, which is what we call abhyanga, uh, the um, <clears throat> touching your own self, your own energy centers uh, through this uh, activity, which we call abhyanga, uh, you can touch, skin is the largest sense organ. And if you can reach the entire skin, if you can dedicate some time for that, uh, even without anything on your hands. It it really makes a lot of difference, you know. But in Ayurveda, we also suggest um, that we use a medium of any base oil, which is cold pressed, of course, all of the good practices, uh, like sesame oil or olive oil or any of the herbal oils, then the effect is many times more so we warm the oil and or you can warm it by just taking oil on your palms and rubbing creating some warmth and doing like circular motions on the joints and long motions on the limbs and on the chest also circular so but getting to touch your own body if you try that you will see you will feel whole because another thing that you're doing by doing that is you're looping back into yourself, which is something that is so much needed because a lot of people are living very disconnected with themselves, very unaware. So this is a beautiful practice that we, we have taught in our classes um, and hopefully all our students are continuing that practice because that in itself is very healing. <clears throat> Thank you for asking that, Josie. Yeah. Thank you for thank you for clarifying that. Absolutely, and um, gra and grounding. And we are we're in our heads. We use our eyes so much. I mean, we're spending the day and we're spending this weekend on a computer, but we use the we use this all the time. This is in our face. So cool water on our eyes and just giving, unplugging, just three minutes, unplugging. Um, it makes a world of difference yeah yes. we have um, four minutes question. any questions there's a question in the chat for you um, do you want to read that yeah or mm. I can read it for you if you'd like yes please okay it's from Graham Stevens in my work I find great strengths in the use of ceremony for both myself and those with whom I work what comments and wisdom do you have around ceremony? Thank you for asking that question. Um, I think I alluded to that very briefly 
in in my slides that when you find a system that you connect with this is very important uh, because you don't have to be bound by when i say system i'm talking about faith religion whatever you are born into um it's not something you have to necessarily be uh, restricted to so once you find a system that resonates with you and if you start to follow the ceremonies of that system that inculcates the wisdom of you being part of something larger of they being higher entities than yourself of the interconnectedness with fellow human beings but also with nature because lot of ceremonies are centered around either uh, celebrating nature like harvesting times you have lot of ceremonies lot of ceremonies are centered around um, paying homage to our elders and recognizing their wisdom so all ceremonies traditional ceremonies are centered around grounding us of helping us reduce our sense of ego and developing humility and the emotion of surrender which always brings lot of peace because once you know that you are not alone there there is you know you are part of a much bigger picture that brings a lot of peace you know because when we become very centered into ourselves that brings a micro focus on everything and we tend to by nature again you have to change the nature through practice by nature we tend to focus on pain so any and all of these traditional ceremonies help us to connect with elements because usually ceremonies are in, involve water fire you know some kind of elements so that all that connection is also reestablished and um, emphasized in most of the ceremonies then also in addition there are usually chants or prayers or mantras which also create a lot of positive sound vibration in the environment which also helps to release negativity from the body and elevate the positivity so these are the things that are not necessarily taught in a scientific medical class but these are experiential things and we need to validate those and accept those and um, give ourselves the respect of acknowledging these experiences because they are profound and sometimes they are in themselves helpful in alleviating major health issues major emotional issues you know you what you did not get in the medical system you went to a shaman or you went to uh, some other faith healer and you found your answers there you know my previous speaker uh, dr zana was speaking about um, uh, the you know the the uh psychedelic practices and you know sometimes you you can experience profound healing there's no explanation uh or uh, repeatability sometimes with these things but that is all right because there's a lot of part of us that is complex we don't understand how it works so we have to continue to respect what we know but also more what we don't know there's a lot what we don't know and lot of these ceremonies address those areas that we do not understand but that which bring us lot of peace and groundedness and lot of answers sometimes to our problems thank you so much i'm afraid we've run out of time i know the people would like to you to keep talking 